Hello everyone, we are deep into the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. We are now entering almost for a lot of people week four of the lockdown. We're looking at 1.5 million cases of coronavirus worldwide, almost 92,000 deaths. Experts are saying we will not see the end of this pandemic until someone develops a vaccine. So that's why I'm here today to talk to Dr. Marianne Stanford of Immuno Oncology Company, IMB based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Welcome, Dr. Stanford. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. I understand that you are actually working on a vaccine called DPX COVID-19 and that you're actually actively combating COVID. Tell us what you're working on. Sure, so the company was founded on a technology known as DPX. And DPX is a way to activate your immune system to induce very strong immune responses. Um, we spent a lot of our time in the last couple of years using DPX in cancer. So really stimulating your immune system in cancer to fight the disease. However, we've always historically had additional programs in infectious disease. Uh, and the most advanced one was one in a disease called RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. So this is a respiratory virus, um, most common in very young babies and the elderly. Um, and we completed a phase one clinical trial in the older adult population. Um, so as the COVID pandemic progressed, it became obvious to us that we had a part to play. Um, the one of the hardest hit populations were actually older adults and the elderly. And our ability to induce very strong immune responses in that population uh, really said that we should be applying the DPX uh, technology to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is it about DPX that makes it effective or that, you, that gives you hope that you think it's going to be effective in treating this disease? So the core concept of DPX is that it holds all the components that you put into the vaccine at the site of injection. And it really forces the immune system to actively interact with that. Um, what that results in are uh, very strong immune responses that can be sustained over time. And that what is what we believe is really key in both cancer and in some infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. So what stage of development are you at? I imagine a lot of people are very excited about the news that there could be a, uh, a vaccine developed here in Canada. So what are, you know, what are we looking at in terms of timelines? So we have a team working pretty much around the clock on this currently. Um, we are currently at the preclinical stage, which is means we're down selecting our um, vaccine target. Um, we are working very hard to move that quickly, and we believe that leveraging the data we've gotten previously with our RSV candidate will allow us to move into the clinic as early as this summer. Okay, so I, I guess you know the next stage is I think there's a phase one, a phase two, phase three before you hit the uh, stage where it's available. You know, I guess for treatment. Um, can you give us a timeline at all of when you think this might be available for people? It's a really difficult question to answer and I think uh, many people hedge this this question for a reason. Uh, there's a typical timeline that vaccines take to get from you know concept to approval uh, but very few vaccines have been developed in an outbreak situation. So I think it will be driven by the data and the science. I think uh, as we start to get clinical data, um, once safety has been established, I think things will move faster than normal, um, but it's very hard to predict mm -hmm. succinctly right now how long that will take. The, the, we are cough commonly here between 12 and 18 months, but I think everybody's working to make that timeline um, as short as humanly and safely possible. Mm -hmm. I understand that IMB is not working in isolation, that it's you know, collaborating with the broader scientific community. Can you tell us what's a little bit different about the work that you're doing and some of the collaborative efforts that are happening around the world? I think what we bring to the table as a differentiator is that A, we have uh, quite a bit of clinical data with our platform, so we understand that very well, especially in the populations that are most affected by COVID but also we're using very small pieces of the virus to stimulate the immune system. So that allows us to target the immune system very precisely to the virus, as opposed to a broader approach where you're either giving the immune system the whole virus it's killed or modified in some way. 
as for collaborations, um, it's really amazing to see the collaborative effort that the world is really taking on um, on COVID-19. Um, we've been very fortunate that locally we have the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology and those clinicians there who have been working with us and they work with us on our RSV program. But we have other collaborators both nationally and, and a real willingness um, in the whole global community to work together, um, which I'm not sure is, is, is common, but it's really great to see. So it's really very much a staying apart, but working together even in, in the scientific community. Yeah, we're physically distancing, but uh, it's, it's amazing the level of collaboration and just willingness to talk and, and trade ideas and, and move it forward as quickly as we can. So how's the isolation of the pandemic actually affecting you and your fellow workers? And, and is it difficult in the lab? Can you, are you able to, I guess, continue to the extent that you're used to? It's challenging. I mean, we have uh, really paid attention to the recommendations from public health. And so all members of our staff who are able to work remotely do so. Um, obviously, if we're physically working on a vaccine in the lab, that requires scientists to be in the lab. Um, but we spend a lot of time between communication and planning so that we can uh, physically distance our scientists as much as possible and where we can't to put in the extra um, personal protective equipment and uh, really focus on protecting those staff mm -hmm. um, because we need them to be working and to be working hard. Right. Are you running into any challenges yourself in accessing that kind of personal protective equipment? Do you have the supplies you need to continue working? So obviously, if you're working in a lab and you're not directly interacting with patients who have, are known to have the virus, the level of uh, PPE that you will need is different. Um, luckily, um, a little forethought is that we were able to secure a fair amount of things like masks ahead of time. Um, and, and as much as possible, we focus on using the lab space that we have. So we try to, to save what we have and um, use distancing as much as possible. Mm -hmm. In your opening your remarks, you talked about that your normal work will say outside of COVID. Uh, had you working on vaccines for things like uh, ovarian, lung, bladder, melanoma, other cancers, and that your strategies are typically to outthink cancer. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how you make that work? So cancer is an interesting problem because it has been shown in many different ways is that if the immune system can be triggered early enough or well enough, your immune system does have the capacity to, to fight cancer. Uh, the problem with cancer is it's slow growing and it kind of has a tendency to out trick the immune system to ignoring it because it is your own body. Um, we believe that using, again, good targets, targeting you know, the Achilles heel of the cancer, um, you can retrain the immune system or re-stimulate the immune system to go after those cancers. Uh, but again, it has to be a very strong platform um, to be able to do that. And that's really where we think um, we differentiate the ability of DPX to induce those uh, immune cells to fight the cancer. Well, thank you so much for your work, both uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine and your cancer vaccines. Uh, we wish you a lot of luck with your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me.